All right, everyone. Welcome back to the uh, Midwest Mountaineering uh, Virtual Expo. Uh, today, starting off our presentations, uh, we have Jordan Harvey. Uh, together with his wife, uh, Tara, founded Nomad Adventures, a uh, world-leading trip and travel consultant agency um, specializing in South American travel. Uh, presentation today is called uh, Patagonia Unbridled Journey Through Southern Chile and Argentina. So without further ado, here's Jordan. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Um, nice to be here. Um, this is now my second presentation that I've done from my living room. So hopefully uh, more accustomed to it. Uh, we call this presentation Patagonia Unbridled. And we're going to really focus, uh, we're going to give you a broad understanding of Chile and Argentina, but focus primarily on Patagonia. If my slide will move. There we go. Um, yeah, so I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, well, a little background on myself. I'm a Minnesota native, um, grew up there and went to Chile as a high school junior for a study abroad opportunity. And, and that's kind of where this whole journey started for me. After high school, you know, I caught the travel bug, the South America bug, and uh, went immediately back to South America, pretty much the, well, it was a couple days after graduation and, and, and traveled and backpacked for that year uh, before going to college. And then after college, I did uh, more outdoor adventure stuff. That's kind of, you know, how we got hooked up with Midwest Mountaineering. I, I've always been a, a huge fan of the outdoors, um, had a stint guiding in Alaska. And then my wife and I, my now wife and I, uh, taught English in Thailand. And then in 2009, we got married. And um, right after getting married, went down to, to Patagonia. Uh, before that, I had been in Patagonia working for an expedition race uh, and kind of cementing the idea of what, what we wanted to do with, with Nomad Adventures. So then after we got married, we moved down and in 2009 founded Nomad Adventures down in Patagonia. Uh, in 2011, we moved back to Minnesota to sort of try to give the business more wings, if you will, be closer to the clients we were working with. Uh, we started a small office in Minneapolis, um, and we've grown what I think is a really nice little company. Uh, of course, this year has presented a lot of challenges and a few steps backwards, but um, we're, we're proud and happy to say we're, we're doing well and looking forward to the future when folks are, are ready to travel more. Um, and we're seeing that now actually demand is finally starting about in Christmas, uh, new booking demand has, has really surged. So what is Nomad? Uh, yeah, we, we're a small company, but we're very focused on, on Patagonia and South America. Um, we've gotten some accolades and are, are pretty comfortable calling ourselves a, a leader in that, uh, in, in that niche, if you will. Uh, we still have our office in South Minneapolis, although it's been converted and, and rented out uh, for the time being uh, while we're all remote and, and, and getting through COVID. Um, Peru, Machu Picchu, of course, Ecuador, Galapagos, but Chile uh, and, and Argentina are our backbone. That's where we were started. And that's uh, still to this day kind of my, my biggest specialty uh, personally. We work with travelers, all sorts of travelers. Uh, we do have some groups like the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, uh, McAllister. We've worked with St. Olaf, a lot of colleges and, and um, some special adventure groups and things like that. But primarily what we do is called uh, FITs, custom trips for you know groups, couples, families, uh, and building their trip and then executing and, and, and doing the operations of those trips. Um, some of our hallmarks are listed there. You know, we, we've always, we were founded by, you know, my wife and I as kids, as backpackers really. And that's not the type of travel necessarily that we do for our clients at this point. Um, but that ethic of travelers, not tourists, um, being a part of your surroundings uh, and, and immersing yourself to the extent possible in a, a week or two or, few, uh, or three is, is something we really believe in. Uh, there we go. I'm having a little trouble moving my slides, but that should go good. Okay, so Chile. Um, here you have it highlighted. 
uh, really, yeah, when I first went to Chile, I was presented with the option of a few different countries to go to. And, you know, you look at a map and you see this really long, thin country with a massive coastline. This is twice the length of, of this you know, a tough coast. And then the eastern border pretty much throughout is the Andes Mountains. So, you know, that gives you an idea that the type of geography and, and the amount of landscapes that are possible uh, in Chile. The Atacama Desert, starting here in the north uh, with, you know, just kind of giving you an idea of some of the main attractions. So I was going to hide my video real quick so I can stop seeing myself. All right. Um, so the Atacama Desert in the very north, really a surreal landscape. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about these regions that are outside of Patagonia that aren't going to be so focused on in the presentation. Atacama to me is kind of the American Southwest meets the Bolivian steppe, culturally speaking, uh, and, and sort of on steroids and, and a dash of Mars, if you will, thrown in there. It's, it's surreal landscapes, it's incredible night uh, skies, some of the best in the world, um, salt flats, geysers, flamingos, you know, wildlife that seems sort of out of place. Uh, so it's a really, it's a really neat, place in a great juxtaposition to what you can see in Patagonia. Um, Santiago is the capital city. That's where trips are going to start and, and end generally, unless you're combining countries. To the north and west, you have Valparaiso and Viña del Mar. Um, you know, Valpo is about an hour and a half from Santiago, so it can be a nice smaller city alternative, uh, more like a San Francisco, if you will, whereas Santiago, we would compare, you know, it would be Chile's version of more, more like New York. Um, then you've got wine regions, you know, you can stay in winery properties as close as 40 minutes uh, to the capital. And then, you know, some of the major valleys uh, where deeper reds are grown are going to be further south a few hours from Santiago. Uh, can be a really nice close to a Patagonia trip to be in a Mediterranean climate and, um, and do some wine drinking and some great food. Then moving down to the, the Northern Patagonia, I'm gonna focus on this area and all Puerto Varas, Cochamo and Chiloé in the presentation. So I won't talk too much. Right about here where all the fjords start uh, is, is considered Austral or Northern Patagonia. Then down South Torres del Paine is, is sort of the crown jewel, if you will, of Patagonia. And we'll talk a lot, show a lot of images from there. And then there's uh, just intense beauty everywhere between. Uh, a little harder to get to and travel to some of these intermediate areas, uh, but happy to talk about some of those as well. Uh, overview of Argentina, uh, big, big country, starting with some of the attractions in the north. Or actually, let's start with Buenos Aires, the capital city where you'll fly into and out of. Great access uh, across the Rio de la Plata to Uruguay, so you can combine uh, some beach or some things in Uruguay, if you'd like, fairly easily, just an hour ferry ride over. Uh, Iguazu Falls, a uh, great attraction. Uh, people typically spend about two nights, three days. That allows you to see both sides of the falls. This is right at the Brazilian border. So, you know, the Brazilian side, a bit more panoramic views, Argentine side, a little bit more trail network um, and hotel infrastructure and some things like that. But you can easily see both sides of the falls, um, get up under them, get that mist on you. It's, it's really an incredible sight. Salta in the Northwest is more of an unknown, but just really incredible destination. It's, this is, you know, latitudinally, this is not too far from Atacama that we talked a bit about. So, uh, but it's also very lush. It's got the red rocks and the high altitudes, but it's got a real lushness to it too. So, um, great wine as well there, great food, just, in, you know, really it's, it's Salta is a province, it's a city, but it's also a very, very large province. So um, you can spend quite a lot of time up here and, and, and not see too many tourists at all and um, have a pretty diverse experience. Mendoza, um, very close to Santiago, Chile, actually an hour flight from Santiago. Uh, Mendoza has got some great hiking. You can do some hiking at Mount Aconcagua. Um, you know, the highest peak outside of the Himalayas. You can do some rafting and food and wine, also a big focus of that region. 
Then starting with Bariloche, we're going to talk a lot about Bariloche. They call it the Switzerland of South America. It's um, a, a big attraction for the Northern Patagonia. And then all of these places, uh, the, the presentation will focus on. So I won't go into too much detail. All right, moving back to Chile. Um, now you see this map uh, blown up, so to speak. Here, here's where we're at in the country. Um, some, these are, you know, the Northern Patagonia is, is, is also referred to as the lakes district. Within Chile, that's what they'll call it. Uh, a lot of lakes, volcanoes, and fjords. Chiloé is this big, big island. This is, well, this is the big island of Chiloé, and then there's a number of smaller islands. Uh, then we have Puerto Varas here, and the Relancavi Fjord is the northernmost fjord of Chile, as well as the Petroe River we'll talk about. A lot of great rafting and fishing activities. And the Valle de Cochamo outside of there is, is a, a lesser known valley. Uh, for those of you interested in rock climbing and, and great granite, that's, that's gonna be a special place for you. Um, so I, I, I spoke a bit about all three of these regions, you know, or excuse me, destinations. Um, Puerto Varas, it's worth noting, it, it's kind of looks a little bit like Chile's version of central Wisconsin. It's a farming area settled by Germans. Cochamo, um, gaucho is really that, that horse and cowboy culture is, a, you know, alive and well in this area. Chiloé is very mystical. Um, it's, it's, it's a sort of a, it's disconnected from Chile, so it's got its own cultural intrigue um, that we love. Here's a picture of Chiloé. Uh, if you can see my cursor, this blue building here, this little, uh, this is a fourplex. Um, and that is, we had an apartment there for about five, six months uh, when we were founding Nomad uh, after being in Puerto Varas for quite some time. These are houses on stilts. You know, these are sea faring people. Um, and that's, you know, their life is kind of dictated by the tides, historically speaking. So the palafitos, as they're called, um, are, are pretty neat to see. They're, it's a really colorful place. Um, they're incredible boat builders. Uh, the Jesuits, when they showed up to Chiloé, they built uh, 80 churches, uh, 13 of which are UNESCO World Heritage Site. Most of these have been standing for hundreds of years without nails. It's just wooden joints, um, which is partly the, where they get that UNESCO designation. Here you've got uh, the Osorno volcano. It's sort of the Mount Fuji of Chile, Chilean volcanoes. Very conical and iconic. Um, you can ski on it. It's a little ski uh, resort on the backside. And you can see this from the Janquiwe Lake, which is, is, is really pretty stunning. It's kind of cascades right into the lake. Here, I'm just trying to show some of these old German households. Um, this is actually the main house of a farm that we, we lived on for quite a while in, in one of the out cabins. Um, here's Frutillar. Frutillar is outside of Puerto Varas. Um, some of just the beautiful gardens. Kayaking is a great activity in the Northern Patagonia. This is on the Relancavi, which is that first fjord, uh, you know, the northernmost fjord of Chile. Rafting on the Petroe, great activity for the day. Really great class three plus, but the big rollers that are a lot of fun. This is a, a family, this is Christmas day. We had them raft. Um, this three generation family that uh, is really fun to work with, did a really neat uh, multi-activity trip. That's, you know, there's nothing like rafting on a really gorgeous river and seeing up to four volcanoes. You know, if it's, if it's a full, you know, a really clear day, you can see four. If not, you'll see mostly just the Osorno right here. Here's up in Cochamo. Um, it has kind of evolved over the years since we first started working. It's and it sees more more traffic, and we don't do as much work there. But it is a valley that you have to horseback or or do a big big hike up to, and then you're you're really off the grid and disconnected. So for the Midwest mountaineering crew, uh, still a, a destination to to consider, and especially if if you're if you're a climber. We call this the, the, the natural water slide, and it really is. You can slide down this whole thing. It's freezing, but uh, really fun to go into that turquoise water off of that granite. 
Uh, more pictures here in Coach Mo. This is Dan. He's our financial controller. He's been with Nomad now. I think we just celebrated his 60 year anniversary. Um, incredible guy. Um, Pucon is another area if you're studying and planning a trip to Chile. Uh, this is in the northern Patagonia. We talk a little bit more about Puerto Varas because Pucon um, just gets more visitors. Uh, it's just more well known. Puerto Varas is a, a little newer in terms of uh, travel, but there's a, a really great lodge in Pucon. Um, again, just the opportunity in the north to A, not travel travel as far, you know, people, uh, the Northern Patagonia figures in on a lot of trips that also have the Southern Patagonia, um, if you have the time. Then there are some folks who, you know, going all the way to Torres del Paine might not fit in their timeline, or, you know, if they're not really into hiking, then staying in the North and having easier access with a lot of multi-activity opportunities, including you know, you can fly fish in the south, but the iconic, you know, big, big rainbow and brown trout and um, and the, the river run, uh, steelhead and things, they are in the north. Vida Vida, uh, one of our favorite properties uh, in, in the north. It's really a special place. Um, so just showing some images there. Moving on to Southern Patagonia, you know, it's on the Chilean side, it's really all about Torres del Paine, so to speak, in the very far south. Um, Puerto Natales we'll talk about, as well as Punta Arenas. Most flights are still into Punta Arenas, which is four hour drives. You know, it's four hours south of Torres del Paine. Puerto Natales sits in the middle. There's also more and more flights, at least pre-COVID. It was really ramping up where you had the option to fly to Natales to cut it down the travel into the park. Uh, you're right on the Strait of Magellan, historic waterway, tons of, of just history and fascinating things with, with that area, uh, as well as, you know, Tierra del Fuego is, on this map, I really can't show it too clearly, but you're right on Tierra del Fuego. So a lot there. And here's sort of the iconic Pine Massif uh, with an Indian fox uh, in the foreground. So yeah, what, why is Torres del Paine so incredible? Well, scenery, um, views, it, granite spires that are just kind of unbelievable, but it's also just a really big, well-managed national park with tons of trails. Uh, and you don't see as much of that in South America as say the US, we're sort of the, the leader in, in large national parks. Um, so you can get in the back country, you can do multi-day back country hikes and stay, you know, camping and staying in refugios. And you can also stay in world-class lodges and do big adventures by day. So it's, it's got a, a, a lot for everyone. Puerto Natales, like I say, two hour drive. Uh, into the park from Natale sits in the middle of where most people are flying. I'm happy to take questions at the end. You know, people who want to do self-supported hiking in Torres del Paine, you'll probably want to plan an overnight in Natale. Uh, that's where you're going to, you know, so the last stop, if you will, and the best place to, to get uh, groceries and things. Uh, and that's where you'll get your bus tickets into the park. Horseback riding. I mean, Patagonia and horses, they they go hand in hand. Uh, so whether you're at a lodge or, or doing something else, if you get the opportunity to spend any time with gauchos, you know, even if you're, you know, there's a lot of folks I've learned through the years who just hate horses or they're petrified, fair enough. Um, even if you're not gonna get on a horse, experiencing gaucho culture uh, in, in some way, shape or form, I just can't recommend it enough. It's so unique. Um, and if, yeah, if you're keen on horses, it's, I mean, it's Pampa. These mountains rise up from nowhere. So outside of there, there's just endless areas of Pampa where you can canter and really, you know, go for it. Um, I've done it a few times because my wife is a big horseback rider and I just, I'm the hold on tight kind of guy. And it's, it, 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 it's a thrill. Uh, here we have the Patagonian Asado, the, Cordero uh, Patagonico is, you know, lamb. It's amazing lamb and it's 
kind of the main culinary highlight, if you will, to do a traditional asado. Here's a view. Uh, this is Salto Chico. Uh, to me, it seems like a misnomer. It's not too small of a waterfall by any means. It's got raging volume uh, and can't really see the massif here, but you've got some, on some days, some really great views. Here's the, here's the massif or the horn, it's also called. Um, you've got multicolored peaks here, uh, which is, is really special. More images here. Here you see the fire bush. This is going to be more in April. You know, seasons are reversed when you're planning your travel. The season in Patagonia is generally considered October to April, uh, reversed from how we have them. So um, spring is October, November. Fall is starting in later March and middle March. And into April, you, you tend to see the, the fall colors more in April. I can talk more about you know pros and cons and seasonality too, if anyone wants to delve into it. We will a little bit more in the presentation too. Um, glaciers, huge glaciers on both sides, um, opportunities to kayak amongst them, hike atop them, or simply view them from, you know, both from the water and, and from land. Here's some glacier hiking. Uh, this is on the Chilean side. It's a little more accessible and the pr price point's a little more friendly on the Argentine side, but they're, they're both good. This, this is uh, Glacier Gray, which this is gonna be the most striking and accessible glacier on the Chilean side. Just watching my time a little bit here. Uh, here you've got an, an image, this would be spring. This would likely be late October, early November. That's, you know, one of the, the big pros there is you're getting spring bloom. You've still got some snow on the peaks, yet your trails should be dried out, less people there. Uh, if, you know, you're, you're taking a, a price conscious approach, Torres del Paine is, uh, you know, October and April in lodges anyways, that's when you're gonna see uh, significant price drops. So there, and less folks there as well. Biking is something you can do uh, when it comes to the lodges. Tierra is the lodge where they, they, they're really into mountain biking. Great hikes um, of all levels of rigor. This is uh, a family trip we did uh, and they did uh, a really nice laid back hike amongst some multi-activity days. Here's the close to the base of the towers. Um, you know, the four towers are these really amazing peaks, um, hanging glacial lake there, and then and a great hike up. Here you've got just some Wanakos um, grazing pictures of the towers. Uh, talk, like I mentioned, there's, you know, we work with all the top lodges in Torres del Paine. Um, got an article where I really try to delve into the differences and differentiate between those if anybody is planning on staying at an adventure lodge and exploring the park and wants to understand more the nuance of comparing and which might be best for you, just shoot me an email um, and I'll uh, forward you that article. Here's Salto Chico, sort of the original Explora. Um, no location is better. Uh, no view from a room have I ever seen in my, my life anywhere quite as grand as, as Explora. Um, they do horses really, really well as well, um, and some unique excursion access based on their location and having uh, their own boats. Here's a view from the room taken. I'm a terrible photographer, um, so this kind of goes to show this is right from behind the glass within my room waking up at Exploda, and I still couldn't screw it up. Um, this was sunrise, and uh, last morning I stayed there a few, a few days ago. Tierra is a really cool property. Um, ironically, the, the woman who is one of the founders of Tierra, the company, um, she's from Wyzetta, Minnesota, and she married a Chilean um, many, many, many years ago. Uh, they own Ski Portillo, the ski resort, and they started Tierra, which now has three lodges, one in Torres del Paine. Really interesting and striking architecture solid location, great access to wildlife on the eastern border of the park. A um, little more price friendly usually than Explora, uh, but still, you know, in that tip top category. This is the deck 
there. Owasi is another option. Um, all these adventure lodges, they've got tons of excursion choices that you can do to, to explore the park. Um, all of which then will be done on a small group basis with other people at the property. Owasi, their whole, their whole identity is that it's private excursions. So you have your own vehicle and guide um, and, and, you know, can have a little bit more flexibility arguably um, while staying at Owasi. Not, not a friendly price point, but a really special property. Here's the views there. So you do get um, the towers more in the distance, but you do get the towers. Patagonia camp is really, uh, I think it's a really special option. Um, the lodges that I spoke of previously are all quite a bit uh, more expensive than Patagonia camp. Yet Patagonia camp has great views they're on a lake where you don't see anyone else um really well-rounded excursions they've got stand-up paddle boards and kayaks right there on site so there's a little bit there's ability to do things on your own not just excursions in the park a little bit better um and still really great food and wine and it's, it's a glamping experience if you will here's here's your yurt uh, at Pat Camp, uh, really tends to resonate with folks that we end up working with from the expo. It's, you know, it's, you've got all the comforts of home, but you're really close to nature. Um, and it's a really casual and fun environment, neat property. So those are some of the lodging options for Torres del Paine. Just gonna keep working through some images here, trying to watch the time, spring. Uh, now we're moving over to Argentina, uh, the northern Patagonia or the Lakes District of Argentina. Bariloche for me is it's really neat. Um, it's got more going on. It's bigger than Puerto Varas, uh, which would be its contemporary on the Chilean side. Uh, yet huge, stunning wilderness from there. Uh, but great restaurants, hotels that are right on the lake and you can do things at night and um, plenty of experiencing Argentine culture because you are in sort of large town or small city, uh, but getting into wilderness during the day. We also mentioned here the Andes Lakes Crossing. You can cross by boat and bus through all national park, through the Andes Mountains between Puerto Varas and Bariloche. That's a pretty cool way to link countries if you're gonna do it link via the north rather than the south. Um, that's called Cruce Andino. They have a pretty, pretty solid website that gives you an idea what that feels like. Here's some images of Bariloche. This is the, the, the famous Zhao Zhao Hotel out on the end of the peninsula. Town is about 25 minutes east along the, the lake. Um, this is Lago Nalaguape. It's massive. And, um, you know, the lake that you're going to be on if you're in Bariloche, this is Lago Moreno, which is you know, just separated by a little piece of land. Here's one of my favorite, two of my favorite people in the world. Uh, Fede is one of, he's our lead guide in Bariloche. He's really incredible. And this is Krista who uh, is on the Nomad team temporarily, uh, not because of everything that's going on. But she, you may have seen her present in the past. Um, she, we can't wait to get her back um, when things are ramped up, but uh so this is these guys exploring, uh, you know, that's part of the fun of this business is we get to, we get to do a fair amount of exploring. Um, these are some images from uh, a friend of ours who owns a brewery restaurant. We'd like to take folks there and really show them that German influence with the beer and the food and uh, works great after a nice hike. And you meet a real cast of characters at Gilbert. Um, Here's Fede again and Rodrigo, another of our incredible guides and operational gurus in Bariloche. Uh, great place to kayak. We do killer picnics. Uh, we like to take people off of Nalwape uh, and take them to a, a lake. It results in more driving, but scenic driving. And then you're out on a lake that does, you know, is, is pure wilderness uh, for a great day of kayaking. I just, Argentina, the food is really special. Um, and we love playing with presentation and having on. And this can be a real uh, treat uh, after a day of kayaking, or excuse me, I should say during. This is a, we set this up on the beach. 
uh, for folks who maybe want to really experience lake country, but not be on a kayak. Uh, we have some really cool little private vessels that we work with um, that allows you to explore some nooks and crannies of the lake rather than kind of going to the main Victoria Island where, where more folks are going. Um, these are some clients of ours um, exploring and we, we love this waterfall. Great little interpretive walk to get to this waterfall. Generally don't see anyone. Um, and yeah, well, just like on the kayak, we, we love to, to, to eat and relax uh, while we're adventuring. More body loche images. Lots of different hiking options from an hour, you know, hike that's still gonna get you great views, which would be the Zhao Zhao hike to up to Cerro Catedral, which, you know, big weather conditions can happen and um, a lot of exposure and um, still largely non-technical, but you know, there's, there's, and then everything in between. So really, really nice place to do some hiking. Uh, now we're gonna talk about the Argentine side of Southern Patagonia. Uh, Perito Moreno is in Calafate. Calafate is where you'll fly to, generally speaking, if you're going flying to Southern Patagonia. People get, uh, there's challenges when planning, you know, Patagonia trips, they tend to think you can kind of move interchangeably through Chile and Argentina, but these are different countries. So um, there's, there's not regional flight routes that connect these. So um, that's part of what we spend our time doing is helping people understand the flows and routes that, that work. And, uh, but flying to Calafate, you've got Perito Moreno. We'll show you that. Estancias. Uh, you know, that gaucho culture and, and, and working estancias as places to stay, Argentina really does it well. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about El Chalten, uh, which is north of Calafate and a great place to hike. Here's some images of Calafate. Calafate is all about Perito Moreno. Uh, this is a glacier that's got walls up to 300 feet high of ice right on the water. So you can get and just totally vertical. So it's really stunning. Um, experiencing by boat, you got to do it in some way, shape or form, whether that's uh, a short 45 minute boat ride from the Southern Arm Pier or a full day excursion going, seeing different glaciers and, and, and icebergs and then ending at Pedito Moreno. There's quite a few different options. Um, again, great place to, to ice hike. There's two different options. One that's a bit more of a taster introductory, you know, ice trek, uh, about 45 minutes to an hour on the glacier. And then there's another that's, you know, these are, these are the national park runs. These, um, they're not our, our own experience products, if you will. Um, there's one concessionaire through the national park that does it. Uh, and they do a really nice job. Here's uh, a little Glacial ice pisco. Pisco is, is an alcohol that uh, you'll probably get a little familiar with if you travel to Chile or Argentina. Just giving you ideas of the, the scale and grandeur of, of, of these glaciers. Here's one of the short boat rides to the face that looks like the southern arm. You can also kayak right along it. Uh, we probably have images here, but you can get within 100 yards on a kayak uh, of these massive walls, there's calving incidents, you know, all summer and fall, spring a little more sparse, but you'll still see calving, uh, just huge chunks of ice pouring into the water. Um, it's a growing volcano, so it's active and it's growing, one of the few. Here's, uh, this is Estancia Nivepo Aike. Um, Nivepo is very uh, rustic and basic but with true Argentine hospitality, countryside hospitality, and it's a real working uh, farm, Estancia. So, and they do over multi-day uh, horseback rides really, really well, if anybody's into that. This is the property of Nibepo. So you're right uh, on some great lakes. And one of our favorite ways to, well, if you're gonna spend a day doing Perito Moreno, you can do it from here. We've got a great boat that then does a nice little hike and sort of goes the, the back door to, to the glacier, if you will. And then in another day, if folks have more time in Calafate, uh, we go to a really, really remote glacier that they use this pier of Nibepoaikes too. And, you know, 100, 150 people a year get there. That's a, it's a tough hike though. Um, sheep is, is, is mainly what 
you know, the farming down, down in Southern Patagonia. Chalten, uh, this is, like I say, this is two hours north driving from Calafate. It used to be a lot more, but they paved the road. Um, it's, it's a little like where I live and reside now, uh, Telluride, Colorado, uh, in terms of a U.S. comparison. You know, it used to be more of a mining town uh, and an Estancia outpost town. And there's just incredible hikes. This is where Patagonia's logo comes from. That's from Mount Fitzroy. That's one of the cooler day hikes you can do out there. This is the Fitzroy Peak. Uh, and you've also got the Cerro Torre Peak here. And they're both great hikes. You can camp a night and link, do those as a, two, as a two day, one night and link them together. We love doing that. Some images of Chalten. There's some other travelers that we love. Our travelers tend to send us photos or we, you know, we love it. And, we ask them to do it. Um, uh, I think these might even be Minnesota Midwest mountaineering type of folks um, on this image. Um, we've had a lot of guest presenters, uh, but here, here, sunset, more Fitzroy. They call it the Fitzroy Laguna Los Tres hike uh, because when you get up there, there's three incredible colored lagoons below the massif. Um, Lodge options for Chalten. Chalten is cool. It's just a really chill little mountaineering type of town. Um, so great B and B type of properties to stay at to do those hikes. If you want more of a remote nature lodge in Chalten, one of our favorites is is Agua Sariba. It's only five rooms. Our friends Ivor and Pato built it. You know, it's their retirement baby, and it's really well done. Really small and intimate. Great hikes and and just privacy out there uh it's it's cool and that's that's outside of Chalten, an hour drive on a dirt road and then a boat uh on to uh to their property ushuaia moving further south now um on tierra del fuego ushuaia you know it's a bit of a port city it's not you know maybe as interesting or as fun as say Chalten, uh, but it's got some good wilderness around it and first and foremost it's going to be your jumping off point for folks, there's a really great expedition vessel, uh, 100 passenger, 120 passenger expedition vessel that goes through the fjords and links Chile and Argentina by Southern Patagonia. That can be a cool experience. And this would be the port on the Argentine side you'd use. And it's also the main port for a lot of Antarctica expeditions. We do a lot of Antarctica travel, uh, combining it with Patagonia and, and trips and, and 85% will go out of Ushuaia, the other 15% out of Punta Arenas, Chile. This is one of the hikes off of that uh, expedition vessel that, that's called Cruceros Australis is the company that run those boats. They do a great job. We've got Humboldt penguins, Magellanic penguins, uh, lots and lots of different wildlife uh, when you're in the fjords. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of sample itineraries. Everything we do is custom for the client. Uh, but, you know, for people who want resources and are planning, whether it's independently or to get inspiration to, um, to work with someone, there's a lot of good stuff on our website. The Argentina and Chile adventure is, we really sort of, I, I do think we were one of the main pioneers of linking Argentina and Chile and doing a country combo via Southern Patagonia. Um, you know, this is a destination that wasn't really on the international travel map 30 years ago, even 20 years ago, not so much. Um, so this is a way to do both the windward and leeward side of, of the mountains and see both sides of Patagonia, both countries. Um, I won't go too into it, but basically the concept is into Buenos Aires, flying south to southern Patagonia, Argentina, to experience glacier country and the Pampa then coming through the Andes Mountains over to Torres del Paine where you hunker down for a bit and do an adventure lodge based experience to, you know, Torres del Paine is massive and the travel day in and out is long. So um, we recommend four nights uh, minimum in the park. That's what you see reflected here. And then we end with a dash of Santiago and, and wine country or the coast. That makes for a really, really neat two week door to door trip. Flights down and back will be overnight. Uh, Minneapolis, for Minneapolis folks, it's almost always gonna be DL 147 and 146 that'll win the price on Delta, um, solid flights. 
Uh, we've got some info here for those interested, uh, those that might be planning. I'm going to try to keep going here so we have some time for questions if there are any. But, um, you know, obviously this, this presentation was made pre-COVID time. Right now, Chile and Argentina are closed off to foreigners um, as they work to keep their numbers down. Numbers are, are really good, relatively speaking, on a global scale um, in Chile. And in Argentina, not quite as good, but you know, reasonable. Um, they were usually, both were far better than the US throughout this whole thing um, until our vaccination program really started to, to benefit those numbers. Uh, Chile is kicking butt with vaccinations. They're in the top five globally. Uh, Argentina is further behind. We're optimistic. We have every reason to be optimistic uh, when we talk about that that come October when the season really ramps up, that uh, things will be open and we won't be seeing too many in-country restrictions uh, in terms of travel between regions and you know, just all the things that have become a part of our daily life during COVID. Um, but yeah, and so we're seeing a lot of folks book travel. We're urging them if they're looking at 21, 22, which most are, it's fine to plan it. We've been, this season we've, postponed everything that couldn't go and we're able to get people's dates moved, no problem. Um, the travel industry has really banded together and worked well together to, to, to do that. Um, but yeah, if you have date flexibility planning for you know October, well, I'd rather see a plan for March, you know, or if you're looking at, you know, November and the Thanksgiving holiday, well, maybe, you know, after the, the Christmas holiday, if, if you have that flexibility, just to be on the safer side as we see how this whole thing evolves globally. Uh, but other than that, uh, requirements to get into the country, there, there, there are none. Um, the reciprocity fees in both countries have been thrown away, which that used to and have be kind of a big, you know, price tag if you were doing two people going to both countries, but they're all gone. Visa upon arrival for up to 90 days. Immunizations, just standard stuff, um, you know, that they would recommend for almost any country, which is being current on HEPs, considering typhoid. Um, that's about it. Paying for things, um, you know, ATMs work, bringing some local currency, ordering it ahead works um and credit cards accepted at you know most places uh larger businesses and things um you know so it's usually a, a combination thereof um charging things yeah i'm not gonna spend too much time on on this stuff you know because i don't think we for this expo right now have too many people turn around to go to chile next month um as it's closed but uh we've got all this information on our website too but different uh different for both Chile and Argentina. Um, you'll need a converter and an adapter. Drinking the water. Um, yes, you can, but I, I don't recommend it. It's just a higher mineral content. Um, so it can give a little stomach bugs. This is more the weather, weather and when to go. Um, you know, I, anytime if Patagonia is in, you know, the focus of the trip, October to April is great. The season's kind of, grown in length. October and April are going to have, you know, some pricing incentives, as I mentioned, they're going to be cooler temperatures, a little bit more precipitation, and it's unpredictable any time of, of, of year. Uh, it really is. I've been snowed on on Christmas Day hiking in Todes del Paine, and the next day been in shorts and t-shirt. Uh, I go in April often, and uh, mo most years I go in April. Um, sort of after the season's winding down and get more time with partners and, and, and friends and it's easier for hotels to give comps and things. Um, and I love that time of year, but it, it's hit and miss um, just like any other time. Uh, but you've got great fall colors in the fall. You've got spring bloom, long, long enough days, plenty long. Um, and summer, you just can't go wrong, you know, that Thanksgiving holiday and on through February, just and these temperatures are deceiving. I mean, if it says, if it's 62 out and you're hiking in Torres del Paine, you're going to be in shorts and t-shirt and hot because it's a very strong sun. Uh, layers, that's, that's the key. Layers and, and sunblock and, uh, and also lip balm with, with SPF is, is huge. People forget about that and that can hurt. It's a strong sun. 
Um, so that that kind of wraps up the overview of, of Patagonia. Um, we do have this travel credit we've always given folks who attend our presentation at the expo. Obviously, I don't have those physical credits to, to give you as you walk out the door, so to speak. Um, so you feel free to email me. My email, uh, again, my name is Jordan Harvey. Uh, my email is Jordan, J-O-R-D-A-N, at nomadadventures.com. I'd be happy to send you those travel credits. Um, and then I noticed, you know, we usually have a guest presenter when we do the presentations at the expo, folks from Minnesota who usually have met us through the expo and then, and then traveled with us. And they, they tend to, you know, I love to have them show their images and give their take on Patagonia. I noticed this is um, still on here from the last one we did in person, some cool images. This is Estancia Cristina in Argentina. I'm just going to zip through these because they really took some great photos. So I might as well show them to you while we've got you. And then I'll I should still have a few minutes for questions um, or I do jump in at any point. Um, this is Estancia Cristina, the Fossil Canyon hike, super cool. Um, that's, you know, the Andean condor is a huge deal um, to all South American cultures, essentially. Uh, here we've got Perito Moreno, glacier hiking, they, they did some hiking. Uh, they also did boats to the face of the glacier. Over to Torres del Paine, it looks like. Here's the Paine Massif. Some great hikes. Salto wow. Chico. Wow, Jordan, think... can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Great, great. I was, I was just trying to find a, a moment there where I could, uh, uh, I was just in awe of these photos. <laughs> Having been there myself, I have, uh, you know, like I was mentioning before the presentation, it's sort of wonderful to kind of uh, see not only your guys' images, but guest photos too, and kind of get their perspective on their travels and, uh, for me personally, it's just a nice reminder of a, of a trip that one I once took in that specific area. Um, I think that you hit it right, right on the head when, you know, it's, it's magical, it's wild, it's um, sort of untamed, and, and yet still very accessible. You know, it, it, I don't think it's, you know, it's not, it, there are places in the world that are harder to get to than Patagonia, let's just put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And thanks for jumping in. Yeah, it's it, uh, for any for, if anybody's out there, I don't even know. This is the most surreal experience ever. To give <laughs> out a uh, talking as if there's a bunch of folks there, and I, I see a few people out there in the chat box. I see yeah, you out yeah. there. <laughs> well, how about <laughs> let's that opportunity? Uh, thanks for for jumping in, Adon. And you know, side note for you folks out there, well, I went into Midwest mountaineering. I think I was you know, getting a couple things before a trip to Patagonia. Um, and that's when I first met it on. And I think, what did we decide that was? That was 2011 or something. Yeah. The 11 or 12. Yeah. We're going, we're going on some time now. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And <laughs> here we are, uh, nearly 10 years later. Yeah. Like, oh, the completos. I, I remember those. <laughs> right. How about that? That, that's not a bit of cholesterol. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. They do, I mean, they do hot dogs and sandwiches. Like, it's just crazy. I mean, yeah. So. <laughs> Lot, lots of caramel. Um, yep. The, uh, the, the, one of the things I remember in, in Patagonia that still, you know, is sort of a, I guess in a, in a way, a talking point uh, with some people that I chat with is the sort of the, the different dialects of, uh, or pace at which speak, people speak Spanish. It's, it's a, is really country by country, and you notice a dis distinct difference from Chile and Ar Argentina. And, yeah, uh, yeah. it's pretty amazing. Um, being a uh, you know Spanish-speaking person all my life, I definitely felt like I had to up my cadence to keep up with the, <laughs> the Chilean Spanish, and, and maybe not the opposite for Argentinian, but it was different. And you know, I think um, you know uh, just picking up on some of the slang and 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 the way they say things is. It's so much. It's so much about inflection and, and how how that word is used and who it's used with. Um, but yeah, I, wonderful countries. I, I really hope to get back down there one day and hopefully to bring my uh, bring my family. Yeah, yeah for sure. vacation. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's funny you mentioned. You know, the linguistic differences are massive, and definitely neither is a, a quote beginner destination for for the Spanish language. Chile is notoriously. I lived in Cuba for a time and that to me was harder. The Afrikaans influence makes a lot of words just totally different, but Chile is really, really tough, but 
that's partly, you know, it, it, it touches on, it's a reflection of cultural difference and mm -hmm. historic difference and, you know, where the, the indigenous communities are vastly different and then how they were settled in terms of the Europeans, we're also looking at very different groups. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's why I chose, you know, we got a million different sample itineraries. There's a million ways people, you can approach these, these countries and mixing and matching and how, depending on our time and interest, but that we call the Argent, our Argentine and Chilean explorer uh, that itinerary I showed. I just love that because if you're able, if you want to really experience Patagonia and you're able to combine countries, well, combining them via Patagonia gives you a unique lens into the cultural differences of the countries, but also of each side of Patagonia. Uh, right. Yeah. And, That's a very good distinction, I think, because they're, they're going to approach it their own unique way with the indigenous people that live there, um, obviously that, that sort of European influence. Um, yeah, they're, the, you know, different indigenous groups are going to view a, a, an area sacred that, that might be sacred as differently. And that's one of what a wonderful piece of knowledge to have and experience. Um, <clears throat> that's well, great. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat box. I was trying to stoke the fire there. Um, but uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, Jordan brings up a good point. Um, I, one of my, uh, just another quick thing, I, uh, Jordan, I know you will attest to this, you know, I, one of the uh, things that I realized when I was down there, and I was fortunate enough to spend a, a fair amount of time down there, close to a year, um, was that I got to see a whole new set of constellations up in the sky, you know, yeah. uh, and just kind of, I literally felt like I was at a different, at the end of the earth, whatever that means, you know, it feels differently depending on where you're at, but um you kind of feel like you're at this, you know, the, the land is just sort of funneling down into this little micro strip until you can reach the very, very end. And then there's nothing but ocean and then eventually Antarctica, you know, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty wild feeling. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, thank you, Jordan. I really appreciate your uh, partnership with the store over the last couple of years. Um, I hope all is well in your world. And uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. There are many, many more presentations coming up. Um, let's see here. Uh, we have uh, Nomad Adventures doing another presentation on April 30th, um, starting at noon. That one's going to be exploring the Galapagos Islands in mainland Ecuador with Rene. Um, and Rene presented on uh, Machu Picchu and beyond a few days ago. That should be up on our YouTube page and on the Expo page as well. So if you missed that and want to tune in, you can watch that 24-7. So be sure to check those out and any of our other upcoming presentations throughout the Expo. Uh, thanks again, Jordan. I will say thank you. thank you so much. Let me take 20 seconds just to say thank you. Sure. I mean, yeah. uh, for the folk, if there, for you folks out there, I mean, just imagine taking this event virtual, putting on this event that they put on with hundreds of different presenters, uh -huh. uh, everything they're doing in the store and everything they're doing to bring the adventure community together and not backing away from that in, in COVID and doing everything they can to support the adventure community locally and and beyond it's 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 a logistical just a marvel that you guys have pulled it off so thanks again for doing it uh, yeah no problem I, our, our pleasure i think you know what, what we're here to do is help people get outside and um adventuring and you know however we can we can facilitate that by any means necessary hey I, just a couple just a couple quick comments came in and actually a question too if you got time sure yeah, I'm on, I'm on no tank. I'm straight here. So uh, someone just saying uh, that was beautiful. Thank you, Jordan. And then another question, um, sort, of maybe, sort of maybe two-part question, uh, is two weeks enough? And also, if you go during the Christian holidays, are things closed or like sort of? Yeah, uh, great question. You know, is two weeks enough is, 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 is tough, obviously, you know. I went for a year. <laughs> I could I could have stayed forever. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So you know, there's that extreme, and then there's folks who, you know, have a week and they want to do Southern Patagonia and they have other interests, and that's that's really, you know, difficult um, and can result in fast pacing. Two weeks is a very nice amount of time. Uh, you can, you know, that sample, for example, that I showed, that's an extensive Southern Patagonia experience. And it's seeing the central regions of both countries. You know, if you start getting Chalten and hiking in Chalten and Torres del Paine, or you say, I want to see Bariloche in the Lakes District, or hey, you know, wine country and Iguazu, those grab me too. 
then two weeks can get difficult to do both sides of Patagonia. Um, you know, but you'll always have to be cutting yourself off somewhere. And two weeks is a really nice duration uh, to be extensive in Southern Patagonia if we're not mixing too many other regions or get a few other regions and experience one side of, of, of Southern Patagonia. Uh, those are both options when it comes to two weeks. Um, so no, I would say that's a great duration and, and you can do a great trip with it with great pacing. Uh, and in terms of holidays, no, things are, I mean, well, you know, these are largely Catholic and, and Christian countries. So, you know, being in the cities, for example, in, you know, ending your trip and being in Santiago on Christmas Eve and Christmas day, a lot of things will be closed. Um, a lot of the restaurants you were thinking about going to, we have to always do special, you know, we do these lists every year of what's open and what's not on Christmas Eve and Christmas day and doing, you know, there's ten, you tend to have to do special dinners and things to, you know, cause most things are just closed. So that can be challenging being down in say an adventure lodge in Patagonia over, over Christmas is, is phenomenal. I mean, cause yeah. the wilderness doesn't close. Right. And the lodges, <laughs> Um, those are their peak times. And so they're humming and they do some special stuff during those dates. So, you know, the holidays is, is the most in demand um, date for, for trips uh, in Chile and Argentina, especially in Southern Patagonia. So availability is your biggest deterrent from those. Um, it just means you have to plan early. You know, like Torres del Paine, I showed you basically all the, the main lodges in and around the park, you know, so it's not like it's going to be bonkers and it's going to be, you know, there's, there's just a limit to how many people can be there, but it's going to fill up a lot earlier and permits and things for, you know, hiking the W same scenario, refugios, lodges. So the biggest consideration I would say for those dates is plan early and then take a bit of a nuanced idea what to where you are on those specific days of Christmas Eve and Christmas day um, as well as New Year's Eve, you know, and New Year's Day, not as much, but a lot of people take work off. So, and also we, we pay our guides more on those days if they're going to do guided city tours and things. So I like to see you in the wilderness on those days. And that tends to be highlights for the trips anyways. And, you know, who doesn't want to remember the day at Christmas day that you hiked in the French Valley in Torres del Paine, you know, that's going to be better maybe than say being you know in Santiago which is also incredible and you're learning about Chile and central Chile but it's a long answer there but uh, holidays are great you can do a great trip over the holidays plan early two weeks is great awesome thank you Jordan um and I don't see any other questions so uh again if you if you do have questions and uh we will sign off here probably shortly soon but you can reach Jordan at uh, Jordan, J-O-R-D-A-N, at nomadadventures.com. And they'll be happy to answer any, any questions you have post-show tomorrow and the next couple of days or the next couple of weeks. So be sure to reach out to them. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jordan. We'll sign off. Thank you, sir. Take care. All right.